Well, uh, we can just talk about uh, what we're, we left off on last time. Um, we had a, um, I, I just got an email a minute ago from, um, let's see here, let me find it. Hello, Francesca. Hello. <laughs> Uh, let me see, where did he just send it to me? Uh, uh, from Naboja, if he's coming, I don't know. But uh, there was, uh, I wrote a, a uh, email back about my thoughts about the uh, PAEI and the, um, uh, uh, and the uh, sort of Space insights time. from, from mm -hmm. Einstein's uh, uh, theory about uh, time and matter and and uh, so forth. And I, I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. And it made me wonder uh, about whether or not, uh, you know, uh, Adesis's PAEI are in fact sort of mirrors that they have to be that way because that's sort of the way the universe works. Um, and I can share that with you all if you want to, we can talk about something else or we can abandon uh, if, we, if we don't want to talk. Well, um, I, I want to uh, um, at least try to understand uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, I've known Ichak for many, many years. I'm a great admirer of Ichak. Um, and I also believe that uh, the basis of the methodology is, is good. It's really good. Uh, I have experienced it myself <laughs> and I've seen at least in my organization what was working and what did not work. And since then I have developed uh, an understanding that uh, the uh, methodology uh, could be a very nice uh, basic algorithm how to address corporate issues and not just corporate issues, because it relates to uh, the way that people communicate and the process of how they make a decision. So uh, the, it's very nice to look at the PAEI uh, at the extreme. And Ichak turns to uh, do it uh, a lot of times by saying, this is A, this is P, this is E. Uh, but the truth of the matter is there are very, very few people that are P000 or 0A00 and so forth. Uh, every one of us uh, is a combination of uh, uh, P and A and E and I. And those of us who are successful know how to change the emphasis from P to A, from A to E, from E to I. And the question is at any point of time, how to really do it. And the, uh, the idea that most people are uh, confined to extreme in any of the PAEI is, is not something that I've ever experienced. But what is really, really important is to understand how to use this tool, because it's a tool. The methodology is a tool. So how do you use this tool? And the, the, the way that it all started, and I've seen Ichak doing it on, on other companies as well, because I was in, on his advisory board for quite a while. Um, so what he will do is he will use his uh, charisma and, and, and personal wit to go in and uh, take suck all the air from the meeting and basically tell the people, listen, here is what we need to do. We need to have a mechanism how to as quickly as possible identify the problem on this organization so I can give you a budget, how much you need to spend in order to, for, to uh, solve it. 
No, that's basically what happened all the years. That's the financial basis of his methodology. And that's the financial basis of his institution. And in some cases it worked and in other cases it did not work. And, and what I think Ichak did not completely do was what um, in, the, in the Israeli military we learn to do after every battle. And that's go and do a, a post-mortem analysis and say what worked, what did not work, what do we need to change? How do we need to move? And don't move without making these changes. And when you make these changes, you need to sell them again, because otherwise it's not gonna fly. And I think that, uh, uh, that, that that is the real question. How do you do that? So in the methodology, uh, he has what he calls syndag. And he has a process of how to make this syndag. And I don't know if any one of you participated in syndags before, but what he usually does, he takes the managers of the organization that he's dealing with. And he, uh, he asks each one of them to take little pieces of papers and write down what do they think is the main problem that we're trying to do. And he collects all of them and he sorts them and he goes through a process of get, getting the group to agree that this is the problem to solve. This is what is called syndag. And once you define the problem, you can start looking at what should be the, the, the tools to solve, to address the problem. So if the problem is um, in operation, there are certain rules that you need to go and pick up. If the problem is in the market, there are other rules that you need to pick up. And all these rules are based on different weight on PAEI. That's, that's what it is. So if I had to uh, summarize the Ichak, the Adijas methodology, and that's something, by the way, that I told Ichak many, many times. I think that it will end up uh, being on uh, two or three pages, not 38 books, two or three pages. I said, I think that what you ought to do is create your 10 commandments and cast them on a piece of uh, stone and say, that is how you start every uh, issue. And, and go from there. So I, that's how I look at the PAEI. And I find it very, very effective. And, and the PAEI is different when you try to solve a problem in a, in a company. It's different in any, any different company. And it's also different in personal relationship, in friendship, in even in spousal relationship. Um, Johan, can I interrupt you and ask you a question? Uh, different in what way? Do you mean the context is different and therefore the application is different or what? expand on what you mean by the PAEI is different? Okay. Um, when you, I'm a physicist. So I believe that the only way to solve an equation is to create an algorithm with all the variables. And I know that if you miss one variable, the result will be bad. So you need to make sure that you do, you, you do the, the fact gathering correctly. It's intelligence. You need before, you can't just sit down and confine all the intelligence to the current thinking of the people that are sitting in the room because not always all the people are sitting in the room. 
Uh, so that's that's the first thing. One of the early uh, people that we had uh, involved with Ichak many, many years ago was a guy from South Africa that we learned that he became the key issue between the Clark and Mandela. And he was able to do something that few people before or after him were able to do. He was able to create a change and manage the change without very bloody civil war that in other cases killed millions of people or, or hundreds of thousands of people. And when we sat with him at one of the Ichak uh, meetings, he explained how he used the concept of the methodology to accomplish what he accomplished. And that's, that's a key issue that you need to understand. And the first thing that he said was that you have to bring to the table all the parties that have interests and list all the interests that you have mm -hmm. and create, if you have three parties, create three circles and create a graphic view of what is the common interest of all these three. And only then start the syndic. You also have to, uh, to make sure that uh, you do it in an environment that does not create bad influence on any of the parties. So when it comes to an issue like uh, peace in South Africa, you're not gonna bring the media, you're not gonna bring uh, uh, the, the voting powers in each country. No, you're gonna bring all the people that represent all the parts, all the parties and deal with all the issues. Otherwise, you have no chance to succeed with anything. And if you have a process through uh, PAEI and CAPI, if you have the process through PAEI and CAPI to run the meeting such that you throw away the issues that you can compromise them and you focus only on the issues that you may not be able to compromise in, then at the end of the process, you can find out if you can compromise and have a deal or if you can't compromise and have a deal. And that's how you solve the problem. And I did it in my companies, more than one, and it was extremely successful. Now, I did not have big problems like in South Africa. You know. yeah. But 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 I had some issues that were very very controversial. In in my companies, uh, twice we tried it to develop something that the majority of the people, most importantly those who fund you, said you have no chance to succeed. And in both companies, we su we succeeded, and we succeeded not because it was luck. We succeeded because we did it methodically and we made sure that the people that had to implement had no questions. Once you make the decision, the implementation becomes easy because you send out all your troops, they know exactly what they do and you can't really sway them away from what they're doing. And if someone, raises a doubt, they bring it back to the, the team and say, listen, we're on our way, but there is a doubt. How do we deal with the doubt? Yom, can I ask you a question? If the same company, same set of problems will be presented and the same methodology will be presented to different groups of people, same methodology, same problems. Is it fair to say that the result 
will not be the same. Well, when you say uh, will be presented to different people. So uh, what you mean to say, I'm just checking. What you mean to say that the people in the group of the company, they are tasked with solving the problem are different people. No, no, no. S company doesn't change. P the, the problem doesn't change, but the people you bring from the outside to help them with solving the problem do change. Yeah, but that, that you see, that is, uh, uh, that is not the question. The question that you have when you run a company is what your company is doing because you have a group of people that work for you, you pay them money, you send them to work and you want them to perform like the best philharmonic that you can, that nobody will perform differently. Now, it is true that the audience may change. Some of them would like it, some of them would not like it. So what you need to do is you need to make sure, how do you make sure that the people that came to your concert will come to your next concert? But that's not the question I asked you on. I asked if the methodology always gets the same result, or it's fair to say that the method, not good result or bad result, all I asked, if the methodology is fluctuated, it's something that can result differently. Uh, okay, uh, so I think that either I did not understand you or you did not understand me. The methodology is not about anything outside. The methodology is only on the inside. It's a tool to solve problems in your company. I understood it's a that. process so, and it can come so, out with all different kinds of outcomes. Huh? Huh? It's a process and it can come out with all different types of outcomes. Right. right. But the so, outcomes can be different. Yes. Am I the right? Outcome, the outcome depends on, on parties that are not within your company and it will be different. And the question is whether or not you can use the same methodology to correct for the inputs that you get from the outside. And the answer is yes, because as long as you understand that the methodology is not going to change your customers and it's not gonna change even your, your vendors or it's not gonna change your, your shareholders, it's gonna change only your employees and managers. It's a way to manage your company. It's not the a way to create you know, results outside that nobody can expect. Will it, impact, will it impact your strategy? Will it impact your communication? Will it impact factors with the way, in the way you manage your company? That's true, it, but it impacts the communication of your company with the outside. Okay. It impacts the, com yes. the, the behavior or the approach of your company with others. And where is it important? I'll give you an example. It is one of the things that is extremely difficult to do is to teach your employees to establish mutual trust and respect with their customers. Because with some customers you can, with another customer you cannot, and some customers will, will tell you, um, you know, we'll do business with you because we have a good, a relationship with you. Other customers will tell you, no, we'll do business with you only because your price is thing and we don't know if we'll do business with you tomorrow. And your goal is to uh, increase the number of customers that continue to do business with you. That's what is, that's what the meaning of branding. Branding is you want to create a loyal of supporters that see you as the first choice, the first uh, choice for anything. Uh, if you're selling cars, you want to be, you better be a Mercedes than, than a GM because Mercedes customers are more loyal to Mercedes than GM customers to GM. So you need to figure out what is in the marketing and the sales of Mercedes that gets better loyalty results than GM.
And it's very complex because it's not just a, a, a linear issue. So what, what I'm trying to understand is in, in the years like you, that I've been in management in an organization, my view is that corporations and management are as ambiguous as can be. There's no stamp, there's no one way that everything should be or can be. And in fact, that's the strength of corporations and solving problems is also ambiguous. The way so, to empower, hold on, the way to empower them cannot be a bulletproof answer to everything. What the reason I asked the question about the methodology, is it an effort to try and solve everything in one way, or is it ambi or is it also ambiguous, also trying to fit and stream? with the fact that the world is ambiguous. The, the, the methodology is nothing but ambiguous. It's, it is not ambiguous. It is the, the, if you think that management should be ambiguous, then Adidas is not for you. Adidas life, is- Life as I see it in management of organizations since I joined it three decades ago is the mother load of ambiguous. I've never seen anything more ambiguous okay. than management. Every okay. single day, every single minute of it. Okay. It's so not uh, they just, hard. So in my, in my opinion, in my opinion, I, I respect what you say. Listen, everyone manages, knows his company better than any other person. But I can tell you that uh, Adidas is prob uh, me the methodology is not for you. Why? Adidas methodology is not saying that you solve all problems the same way. Not at all. It says, but it says you solve all problems using the same tools all the time. That is the difference. Adidas is not telling you how to manage your company. It doesn't even tell you how to uh, uh, solve your company problems, it gives you tools. And it says that any time that you don't use these tools, you may be losing something. The ambiguity that you have experienced may be the source of your management uh, uh, issues. Yeah. So Michael, I, I, and I'm listening to your conversation back and forth, and maybe this sheds some, lights on, sheds some light on it. But 20 years ago, when I first read uh, corporate life cycles. One of the things that I got out of it, and I, I'd be interested, Yoram, if, if you and Michael see this the same way, but is that there's a dance that you can't go in a straight line from, from point A to point B. Let's say you want to get to prime. You're, you, first, you're, uh, there's some analysis that goes on to try to find out what stage am I in? Uh, what is my, you know, and I'm using PAE and I to sort of, uh, to, to understand my current context. Then, uh, to get, for example, from GoGo, -Go where everything's falling apart, I'm having great success, but everything's falling apart, and I keep going up and then falling back and going up and falling back, to move into that adolescent stage, which means to de-emphasize the P and to put more emphasis on the A, which has been probably ignored, could be ignored when the company was smaller. It's not working to ignore that when the company gets bigger. So the context has changed, but the process that I use to... to a, a, to analyze my situation has, uh, is the same process. Uh, and I've got some guidelines because I see this corporate life cycle that goes up. And the only thing I disagree about, about that is that it goes up like this, I agree. It been peaks like this, I agree, but it always goes down and I find into a straight line and makes a crater. I've never seen a soft landing the way it's drawn. Um, but anyway, it, it's the same tools that I use. And even if I wanna rescue myself from bureaucracy, um, I, I'm, I'm using the same tools. I'm recognizing what's missing and so trying tools, to, to put that so back. The tools, the tools could be tools of asking yourself questions. They could be tools that help you understand things that you see, a way for you to get feedback, to get data from the way you interpret the world you work in. And it, it might serve some because they don't have a way to test. 
to put what we call the toes and, the, and their fingers into the world they manage. And some have a, a, a very intuitive, a very well done way to do it with or without. And so what I think what Joram is describing is a systemized way to get the information, to ask these questions, to get what I think is missing from this exercise that we've been doing now for a good few weeks is few case studies where somebody gives us three cases of different natures where of different nature where three companies have used the same exact methodology in different places and where it served in an exquisite way to help them move from point A to point B or whichever point and where somebody who doesn't know the methodology like me can say, now I see the journey. The reason, the reason why uh, Ichak is talking so much about family life and, uh, and marriage and love and, 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 and all that stuff is because uh, he makes an analogy uh, between a life, life cycle of a family to the life cycle <clears throat> of a company. The difference is in a life cycle between the life cycle and the, uh, of a family and a life cycle of a company is that companies often live longer united yes. than families. Families, even successful families, at some point of time, separate, and each uh, family or each ch child creates its own family, and the relationship between the children's family and the parents' family is different than a relationship of a subsidiary uh, companies and a parent company, for many many reasons, and uh, it is really uh, clear that if you continue to do the, to use the same tools when the situation is changing and deal with the problems before they become lethal, then you can extend your life. So a life cycle of a corporation could theoretically goes like this and then even this. Yes. And you want an example? IBM is probably the best example. IBM almost died when they realized that they missed the, the PC revolution and they are about to lose the entire market. So came Lou Gerstner and said, let's do a really a good syndic there. And he did, and he found out what is wrong. And he made a huge change that uh, IBM is no longer an international business machine. It is an international business machine applications. And therefore he, he sold all the hardware and focused all the software and time will tell if, we, if, if it will be successful. There are other companies that didn't do that like Kodak. Kodak did not do that at some point of time when they realized that the market for films is changing. It's not disappearing, but it's changing. They refused to change their approach and their strategy. And the result and they, even is, made the, they even invented the thing that took the company down, the digital right. camera that was right. invented by Kodak, which is even right. more. But it, it didn't have to take the company down. The same no, thing differently, differently is Xerox. Uh, so you can see, uh, uh, time will tell if Bank of America will be able to survive or GM will be able to survive. When you look at what the management does uh, at the time of crisis. And, and so what Ichak is talking about is that, and what he's saying in simple English is the same tools that you use in your family you need to use in your company. Because if you want to save your marriage, you need to continue to love your wife. If you don't love your wife, 
if you stop being your, your, your wife friend, you're not likely to save your marriage. So here, hence he goes to, let's understand what friendship means. Let's understand what love means. That is the reason why he's talking about all this thing. And quite honestly, you probably witness it like me. He's not sure that he's clear on that. He's confused all the time and he's going here and back. And, and it's despite the fact that the guy, the man is brilliant. But so you, so Tom, you gave examples of companies that did not renew themselves, that did not reinvent the wheel. And you talked about the system that is a system of management. These are two different things, I think. No, the you reinvent yourself. Only management can reinvent itself. You wait, can't wait, reinvent wait. itself with a miracle. Wait, but a system of management is something that will engage with the management of the company on ongoing basis, making sure it manages itself. It isn't, it could also lead to a new product, to resurrection, to something which invents also new products. These are, to my mind, two different things. Identifying new products for a company like IBM or Kodak or Xerox, this is disruption. I don't, what I hear Isaac, Isaac talking about isn't disruption, it's really management, a system of managing a company. Okay. It's managing, called... it's managing the board, it's managing the staff, it's managing okay. communication strategy. Could it lead to disruption? Uh, no, no. Uh, you know, uh, Ichak he used different words. Ichak, what you call disruption, Ichak called change, right? What you call disruption, Ichak called change. And it tells you that change happens all the time and you can't really stop change. And you have to adjust your management to the changes. And so when you're talking about what happened at uh, Kodak and Xerox and all that, uh, these, these are exactly what Ichak is talking about. What happens when there is a change and the management is busy fighting each other, not looking at the change and they miss it. That was just last time, right? You have full amount of energy. The more you use internally, the less you use externally. And when you don't use externally, you don't see. So I, the ducks I'm... go before you and you just don't see them. So, so if afraid. you can, if you can reduce, if you can reduce the amount of friction in managing change, then you have a chance to succeed. Now, managing change is very difficult because the people that you have in the company are not robots. And some of them leave, some of them die, some of them are new, some of them got personal crisis and they're not the same people anymore. All the things, the thing that you need to manage, and if you don't manage it, let's make sure that you are guaranteeing to become a general electric. Look what happened to Jack Welch. Jack Welch started to uh, gobble a lot of companies. He couldn't really make the people talk to each other. The, the, they did not even understand his own philosophy how, how to run a business. And soon enough, the thing fell apart. They lost everything that they had. There is nothing that GE owns today that it was an excellent vendor 50 years ago. They're so now I, just I, on a, on I a realize, path of that. I realized something else from the conversation, and that is that it, the methodology is for companies that are unable to go th to growth through change, that are unable to find their change. It isn't for anything or for anyone, because conceptually it is different than the way I see your um, disruption. The okay. way I see disruption on daily basis, it is achieved completely different in a different way than the methodology. We present problems to a thousand teams and they each come 
with a different solution. Doesn't matter. Whatever you present the team and the team come back to you, it's exactly how any company deals with its own different customers. So you present to, 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 to your customers the product that you have available and they come and tell you, listen, we don't want to buy it. We want to buy something else. And you need to know how to deal with it. And that creates a change in your management. Go ahead. Uh... Do you know uh, Peter Schutz? Yeah. So uh, Peter was the CEO of, uh, of Porsche for almost the whole decade of the 1980s. Yeah. And uh, he was the one that when they were trying to come out with 924s and 928s, he was the one that went back to 911s. Uh, and Peter was the one who introduced me to Itzhak. Uh, he had done it at Porsche and, and worked with Itzhak there and so forth. And, and he, he made a, a, an interesting thing. He said, I, I have um, an idea for, an, I, I got an idea for a new engine. And it comes from all the engineering department. They can make this engine so wonderful. And on the other, so I've got one note from them. On the other side, I've got an envelope and it's from a cross-functional team. And it's come, come together with a suggestion about how the, what the new engine should be for the 911. He said, he said, I can take this one and just throw it in the garbage can. I don't even have to open the envelope. Because although it may be brilliant, it's not implementable. To your point, I think that both of you all are going to. This one, on the other hand, I know this, this idea. I can, we can move ahead with this idea. It may not be as good as the one that engineers have, but I can implement it. Because it's had... The mutual trust and respect. Everybody's had their say. Like Yoram started off saying, you're, you've listened to people, you've pulled it in, they've been heard. Now, it may not be that the company has decided to go in the direction they suggest or they think is correct, but they've had their say. They had their chance to convince uh, the group, and the group decided to go another way for, for a whole lot of interrelated and interdependent reasons. And really, I, 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 I'm, I'm still trying to digest this strive for mutual trust and respect. And Good. when I, and when I look back, and when I look back at different places, different teams, different management, when was with honesty, you know, taking off my clothes, staying naked, not literal, but staying naked, complete honesty. When were people truly trustful and respectful from each other? Were they created like that? No matter what I did. Ah, I, I, Henry, Henry, no matter what I did. And the person with them paying their compensation was doing everything, into, including juggling in the air telling them how much he loves them and respects them. And still, they would do everything in the world to stick knives at each other. This effort to mutual trust and respect is as gallant and as godly on earth as one can. People will stay people. And while we stay on this mountain, saying part of the effort to create and innovate is people stabbing each other. And the only way to create ideal mutual trust is respect is to make them all sleep. Then they are all trustful and respectful. While they are all awake, there will continuously be people trying to poison each other, jealous of each other, being in competition with each other, not because anybody feeds them that, but because it's part of human nature. Well, hmm. that's what A, what P A E I Francesca, I've managed people. I love people more than anything I do. And yet people behave this way, no matter what I say to them. Well, well, well that's what PAEI is all about. Of it's changing enabling. their behavior patterns? Your no, no, wait, 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 wait. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I'm saying it. P 
PAEI is some kind of a filter that enables you to pick among the people that you manage those that you can trust and respect. I trust Why? all of them and I respect all of them and yet they behave the way they behave. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that if, if you trust all of them and they behave the way that they behave, it's not mutual. Mutual means both okay. sides do the same thing. What you describe right now is you slash the M in the TNR. You say, I trust them, I respect them, but they're schmucks. There are, there are stick knives in mm -hmm. me, there are bad people. There are, Be Be and because you, you know what you are, because they contribute to the corporations, they contribute to the company, they are talented, and I do not control their value I, system, their ethics system. It isn't something I can switch on and off. Well, yeah, but if you start thinking as a controlling manager of the company differently on how to cause people to mutually trust and respect each other, you may receive different results. Hold, hold yes. on, Henry, let me just sneak in one, one more uh, sentence. Do you remember yeah. that lecture that Icha gives do you invest 90% of your energy into internal marketing and energy, or do you invest 90% of it, or however percentage, into external? Yeah, but if you are, you know, you know very well that if you have bad ingredients, the recipe does not. I don't end. see. I don't see that as bad ingredients. I apologize. I see that as human nature. I have no control of how humans behave and engage. I do not position changing people's trust and respect. I did not create them. They did not come from my womb and I apologize. This, remember my comment at the beginning, this methodology cannot be stiff. This ideal that all people have to have mutual trust and respect does not sit on my shoulders as a must. I'm oh. sorry. It's well, not a Tesla battery. Henry, sorry, I'm done. So uh, my thoughts on this, and this is interesting, these have evolved a lot over my, my years of uh, managing people. Um, but, and I got a great thing that you, you uh, early on, maybe 25 years ago, someone said to me, you should be 100% responsible for yourself and to others. So you don't have to be responsible to, for others. Now, maybe your baby, you know, if you're not responsible to your baby, it probably won't live. But once they get to be adults, then you're 100% responsible to them, but not for them. But you're 100% responsible for yourself. So the thing I wanted to, to, to comment on is that, would you agree with me that human beings as the, are the one species that have taken over the planet? Absolutely. And this did, did this happen because the whole time they were humans were trying to take over the planet, they were stabbing each other in the back and, and uh, working against each other. And I think you'd have to agree that that's not the case, that what's happened is we have the, the one superpower. And this is the Neanderthals, I think, were bigger and stronger than Homo sapiens. They had bigger uh, uh, skulls, implying a bigger brain. So perhaps they should have won. They were smarter than us. But the thing that, that I understand that, that Homo sapiens had was this uncanny, uncanny ability to collaborate. So where in this collaboration that's resulted in the elimination of all other Homo everything else, there are no other Homo anythings. There is what genus and species, there's no other species in that genus. Uh, that that see, strikes me is that maybe we might have stabbed somebody else in the back. We might want to got you know some giant tapers that we were trying to eat in Australia. We might have gotten the Homo uh, Homo erectus and might killed those guys off. But to, but we collaborate, and it's the power that has big skyscrapers and huge cities all around the world. It, it's it's kind of the negative consequence of impact on our on our, our uh, environment and so forth. But this. You know that you're right that people sometimes behave in a petty way, um, but this is when I think we was, was kind of harken back to Sun Tzu, and I had this conversation with somebody just yesterday, 
you know, he said that I can teach your geisha to be an effective army. And the, the you know, the emperor says, no way, you can't te teach my geishas. And so he gets them all lined up there. He goes, oh, come up here and stand up at attention. And they started tittering and laughing. He takes the sword off and cuts one's head off. And there's the dead one lying there. He says, come to attention. Whoop, they're all at attention. Shocking, right? So the choice is, if someone's going to stab somebody else in the back, is that stabbing in the back part of the culture that you want in your company? And if it's not, then you say, okay, here's the culture. I don't, I'm not saying it's the best culture. This is what I do anyway. Here's the culture I want in the company. And it means that, you know, my, my first thing is to do right. So we're going to do right. If, if stabbing somebody in the back, is that right? Everybody agrees it's not. Okay. Anyway, so, I mean, I'll try to work with you because this is the type of thing that we could kind of go. But I had a guy recently who I really liked. It was a truck driver for me. I very much appreciated him. We were good. We were, I thought, good friends, to your point. And uh, we noticed that he was checking in electronically on his phone when he first woke up in the morning and basically stealing time every single day. And so we confronted him and we said, hey, we noticed that you checked in about a half an hour ago, but yet you've just arrived. So we're, what is there something we don't understand? Please tell us the story. He goes, no, no, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I've never done it before. So well, what about Tuesday? He's like, what about Monday? And, and, and we, we fired the guy on the spot. So we were Sun Tzu. We cut the guy's off. It's not okay to steal from all the rest of us here. And so, and I assume that message goes through the company. We never said to anybody why we let the guy go or, or made an excuse or anything like that. He just didn't work for us anymore. Um, but that, that's protecting that culture that we felt like was important to have what you're asking for, Michael, the, that everybody will work together and not conspire to work against each other, that we'll either succeed together or, or we will not succeed, but we can't succeed without you know, all of us moving up. So there's a, you know, there's a win for everybody or, uh, or we're gonna suffer from much less wins. But anyway, that's my, my thought about what you said. And, and I, so I just have this belief and it may be an ignorant, stupid belief that people are good. And, and that's my belief. I've just chosen to believe it. And once I did, everything started happening beautifully for me. Well, I, 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 I agree. And, I, and basically, I, I've, I was listening to you and what you describe is how you change your attitude from accepting something to not accepting something. And I was thinking, uh, maybe you can go and say, what was the process of changing from accepting to not accepting? And why did it happen? Apparently, you realized at some point of time that this is a survival issue. That if you know that someone is stealing from you and you do nothing, rest assured, everyone will steal from you. Mm -hmm. And you said, because of that, it's not the little issue if he logged in 30 minutes, it's the trust and respect. And that what basically made this change. Now, the message that you sent to your company saved a lot of friction of people asking each other, how can I steal better? How can I think friction that will hurt the company? Because mm -hmm. of that, your employees, not even thinking about, became more effective and more efficient. If you make more effective and more efficient, you are more likely to succeed. Now, it does not mean that this was the only problem that you had. You probably had similar problems. Uh, you saw that one customer that you have stick, stick you all the time, and another one is more loyal. And, and maybe you have been thinking along the same line to say, okay, how do I direct my sales uh, team to uh, encourage this customer more than the other customer, regardless of how big are the revenues or even how big the margins in. These are processes that are based on the same methodology, the same rules that make the difference between companies and what make them do. And, and yeah, 
when you manage a company, you cannot deal with all the thousands of people that work for you. The only thing that you can do is you can deal with your management and you can make sure that your management have the same values and the same plans that you have. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, this guy was uh, under vice president and so and so. If the vice president of so and so learned from this experience to make sure that he checks all the time cards through all the supervisor and so forth, you made a change in the company that is huge that otherwise you will not be able to accomplish. That is what it is. It's not, uh, uh, you know, people think that you, you need to uh, have the Ichak show in order to solve things. No, Ichak just gives you tools and his show is just showing you what to do. That's the reason why he said what he's saying. And the mutual trust and respect cannot be done with people that you don't personally know. Go ahead, yes. Francesca. No, I'm, I'm not managing anyone. So. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that it's the same for the private life. Uh, you can choose to spend time with people that has the same value as you have. And that's a choice that you can make to answer to Michael. And the, 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 the people, um, when you work with people, I, I'm trying to choose the people that have the same value. And if someone is lying or uh, making tricks or trying to cheat or things, or, I don't like it. So I, I'm not spending time with people like that, not because I'm better than he is, but because we don't have the same value. And I think that the methodology of uh, Alice is, is about that, about choosing people <laughs> I, I, I'm dreaming maybe, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, to build the distrust and disrespect, it's important to, to have the same value and to, to, uh, to show an example to, to the people to whom you want to, to work with. If I may, if I may, it is, I, I know that no, but I, uh, I want to explain why I know that no. I don't think the Ichak methodology is how to choose the people that you like. I agree. Okay, Ichak okay, methodology okay, is okay. the opposite. Okay. It says in a company, mm -hmm. you have people that you need to live with them. Therefore, you need to learn how to talk to people that you don't like. You need to figure out how to talk to the liars, to the cheaters. What, my, what Henry just uh, described is how he spoke with someone he didn't like. He fired him. Yes, okay, but, but he he's, choosing, he's choosing him if he fire him. <laughs> it's not right? choosing him, okay. No, he, he, he fired him because it was not enough mm -hmm. to say, okay, you can continue. Or, or if you stop, it's not going to stop the problem. The message to the company was more important than the person itself. So even if the person was a likable person, he had to fire him in order to send the message. When you manage more than your wife and your two kids, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then you have to take the repercussion. You need to do with your child what you hope that he will do with your grandchild. It's the same thing in a corporation. So trust and respect takes years to build and a minute to break. Now, when you detect that there is a crack in the trust and respect. You have to make a decision. Is this person important enough to the organization that I try to uh, fill the gap or I cut him out? And, 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 and here's a very good example in, in Henry's story. He looked at that and said, maybe a great person, but if I fill the crack, I miss the point. And that is what he did. And I, I, I believe that this made the company better. And his, his loyalty was to the company because in his management team, there is more than one guy and all of them must all the time trust and respect Henry as much as he 
trust and respect them. It is the mutual issue that people have difficulties. And, and, and Michael has difficulty with, with the mutuality of his employees. And you may have a difficulty with the mutuality of people that you don't like. Now, I, I when I look at that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking at, at issues like the peace in the Middle East or the, the issue with, the, with the, um, South Africa. There's no question that the Clark didn't like Mandela. <laughs> they put Mandela 20 years in prison. And there's no question that Mandela thought that the Clark is a racist and a liar. There's no question. But there was no solution without having them into a, 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 a meeting, looking at each other, bringing their griefs and says, why can I forgive what I cannot forgive? What do you need to do to gain my trust? We're not going here hating each other. We're going it with some kind of elevated mutual trust. And respect. So mutual trust and respect is not a binary issue. And it's something that you need to really be conscious of. And, and what I learned in my case and is that as long as I was able to broadcast in the mission of the company, how important is mutual trust and respect and what does it mean? What does it mean? When I, when I, when I said that uh, to my HR manager, that I love her, I didn't mean that I want to take her to a hotel and have sex with her. No, yeah. not at all. But I still loved her. I loved her mind and I knew that as long as she does not change her mind, we can have mutual trust and respect. So if I want to create a relationship with any person, I understand based on the methodology that my goal is to keep the mutual trust and respect close to 100%. I can't say 100%, but close to 100%. And every time that there is an input that comes to uh, the person that says, you know, maybe this guy who, um, is not what he says. I try to figure out how to bring it to a discussion and end the discussion with a resolution. And the resolution can be either way. But if you don't bring to a discussion the most important things, you can guarantee they will go down the tube. That is the issue. So if you realize that the methodology is not a way to attack anyone, and it's not a way to correct anyone, it's a way to diagnose the problems and a method to address the solution. Syndag is diagnosis, systematic diagnosis. That's what Syndag is all about. How do you define what Henry said? How you define that the problem is not the half an hour that the guy cheats, but the fact that it can really ruin your company. It's his attitude toward the company, he does not trust the company to pay him what he deserved that he should be paid. Yoram, he was stealing money. It's not mutual trust and respect. But, but yeah, he's, but why, he's, a he's a thief. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But why people, okay, that, that is a very interesting point. Uh, why someone becomes a thief? Nothing to do with the methodology. No. Nothing to do with the methodology. There should be a system in every company that ensures that people do not steal. Has a lot to do with the methodology. The methodology does not make a person a thief or not thief. Correct. But, but the, methodol the methodology helps you diagnose that he became a thief. That's the methodology. Not you can uh, you can't change anybody. So this is I think also you about can the diagnose. methodology. Hmm? I, I, I'm sorry, the, the, for, for me, mutual trust and respect isn't about people who are crooks and thieves. 
this is something that there are other people, including the CEO, who is supposed to be above all of that, uh, who is working on that. I think mutual trust and respect is about priority, is about people who care. Can you, can you trust and respect a thief? No, you are, you're taking me- Can you, no, I'm asking you a question. Can you uh, trust and course, respect the thief? Of course not, but I'm not thinking, when I think about mutual trust and respect, I'm thinking about other things, not about people who steal. This isn't trust and respect. This is about priorities of the company. Why it is, I yeah, I, seriously, I wasn't thinking about a, an example like Henry. Okay, this so is, maybe you should. Into, it, it falls into completely other categories. These are thieves, crooks. So, and, and I think what Yoram was getting ready to say, I, I, if I'm reading his mind right, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but Be right. I, I think that there's, that he, he, if the fellow who feels like he's not being paid fairly for the work that he does, then he tries to square the, the, the tables in his own mind. Now, whether he's fooling himself or something else is something different, but there's a reason why he stole. And the yeah. question is, since I can't control him, He's not in my control, mm -hmm. but I can control myself. Then the question is, is there something that I could have done? And this is the obligation that weighs on me all the time. Is there something I could have done that would have made him comfortable bringing up the fact, if, if it were true, uh, to Yoram's uh, point that he almost made but didn't quite, but I smelled, uh, is, it, is it possible that, that he would have liked to talk about his salary and what he thought he deserved, but he was felt uncomfortable bringing that up. Henry, Did I create that context Henry, somehow? That, per th that person steals not only from you. Doesn't matter. Yes, but you- Does not matter. Even if he's a, tr a terrific truck driver, you mm. shouldn't have people who have an easy fingers or hands mm. on your system. You should have a system that ensures that this doesn't happen. And you and should so, ensure that people like that wouldn't be part of your system. And, and this is the issue of, do I want to check for, uh, for uh, 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 quality in the process or do the process just generates quality? That's the sort of, the sort of thing. If I have people in here who don't feel like stealing, then, I, then it's much easier for me to, to make sure that they don't. Um, and, if it, and if I have the, the, the best mechanism to guarantee they don't, then they get more and more clever to try to find out how to do so. But if I'm believing, as I told you I did, that people are good, then 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 I have to have to have some responsibility or it, it only pays me to try to take responsibility to try to understand the context and the situation and see if I can improve the context. But it doesn't but, necessarily but, guarantee me to be safe. But, but anyway, I but again, can, can, can I say something, uh, Michael, Henry? I think that you hit it on the nail with one little uh, change. You don't have to believe that people are good, but you need to recognize that people pay you to believe that people are good. Why mm -hmm. is that? Why that that matters? The difference between what Michael is saying and what you are are saying is really clear. Michael is very binary. He says, listen, I have no control. Other people are bad. If they are bad, they are bad. Oh, I and didn't I, say that you are. No, wait, wait, let me finish. And if they are bad, I can't trust them. I can't trust thieves. I can't trust uh, 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 other people. And I'm saying, I understand. In your life, you can decide not to trust thieves and not to that. But when you're managing a company, you have to learn how to trust every one of your employees. And if you cannot trust him, then you have to replace him. And it's not that you trust, but the other person needs to trust you because if he does not trust you, what he does, he goes to his fellow employees and you basically, increase the distrust between the employees and the CEO or the manager. Yoram, Yoram, I, 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 
Uh, let, let, let me just, just finish what I say. I can tell you that Mandela thought that the clerk is a freaking thief and he should not be talking to him. He's a racist, he's a thief. But because there was something bigger than what Mandela thought, he said, I need to solve the problem because otherwise I gain nothing. So I will talk to the thief. And what would I do? I will engage in a process that will build trust and respect between me, the victim, and the predator, the thief, so we can somehow solve a problem. Be, without trust and respect, you can't solve a problem. That is the methodology, not, you know, doesn't tell you what to do, it just gives you rules. And the rules are that to solve a problem, you need to establish trust and respect. And if the trust and respect is below certain level, you cannot solve the problem. How can you establish trust and respect uh, among people whom you do not control? You have no switch to establish trust and respect. Among, uh, give me a second, Johan, hold on, one second. <laughs> one second. I have hundreds of employees who are not employed by me. They are all volunteers in an organization who still work for me. I bring a donor in, they all need this funding. And I say to them, respond to the donor. You need his funding. And most of them will not even respond. They will not respond to the donor who writes, please sir, send, send in, se certain information and you will get funding. And I will write to all of them, my employees, and say, here are the certain, certain pieces of information you're being asked by me, your CEO, and the donor, send it in, you'll get funding, which you are thirsty for. They are okay. not thieves, they are not crook, it's not their priority. They okay. need the funding, they don't respond. Don't this, is, this is don't mutual respond. trust and respect. You, okay, can, can wait, I wait, wait, quickly wait, answer wait. and then uh, let me respond. quickly, yeah, go ahead. Oh, just hold it for just a second. I, I want you to come back to that. But Michael, you were saying no before when Yoram was speaking. And and then he, of course, he goes on. So then you respond to the end of what he said. But back in the middle, do you remember what you were saying, shaking your head no, that, that he, he was attributing something to what you had said? And, and I think you disagree. Yes, because I don't believe, I believe that all people are good. I don't believe that people are crooks. I believe that all people are good. And I need them all but I cannot change the way they manifest their behaviors. I embrace them the way they are. I cannot change. Do they disappoint me? Yes, but I accept their differences of behaviors without the ability to tune them. They are not a station on an FM tuner. They behave sometimes, which is if it was me, I would behave differently. Would I have loved them to behave differently? I would. Do I have control over it? I do not. Do I call it trust and respect? Only since the methodology of Ichak entered my life, I start asking, is it trust and respect? Does it meet my standard? No, it doesn't meet my standard, but they are all part of my family or organization, and I live with it. Is okay. it disappointing? Yes. It limits the growth of the organization, but I cannot change it. Can, can, uh, can I answer your question? Please. Michael, uh, you don't need to control anybody. Right. And you can make a change without controlling. I'll okay. give you an example. I'll give you, I have a great example here. A great example. I'm trying to establish trust and respect with Francesca. Do I control Francesca? No, no, at all. I, but I'm saying to her, listen, I think that we can become friends and create mutual trust and respect. I don't even know on what. But it is not because I want to control her. It is not because I want to tell her what to do. 
It is because I'm saying to her, listen, if you want to have any dialogue with me, it would be more effective if you want to do it rather than if you have to do it. Therefore, if you want to do something, you need to trust me that when I'm approaching you, I'm not having anything that may feel you uncomfortable. But All Francesca, is, Yon, but Francesca doesn't well, do work. Well, well, let, let me finish. But Francesca finish. doesn't do work for you all year long. That doesn't matter. It does matter. No, she I did it with my, you. Uh, I did it with my employees. I did it with my customers. I did it, I'll tell you what, I did it with my investors that poured hundreds of millions of dollars into my ventures. I did it with them. It was personal. I came and said, oh, you have to make the decision. The question is, do you trust and respect me as much as I trust and respect you? And they do not all, all of them do not sometimes disappoint you. Some of their behaviors isn't below your trust and respect. All of them are all to the power. No, no, nobody disappointed me because I don't expect anybody to do anything. But in the oh, dialogue, so maybe that's the, the yeah, well, maybe that's let the me key. finish. Let me finish. In the dialogue, in the dialogue, I use the tool. Those that, that the tool worked on them were a success. Those that the tool did not work with them were a failure. I didn't get all the money that I approached, but I got the most of it. That means that the tool worked most of the time. The idea that you go to an investor, not just by a business plan, but by gaining his trust and respect. I, when I raised money for my company, I went to people basically telling them why they want to invest in my company. Not what they have to, why they want to invest. And, and, and I can tell you that a lot of people that never met me before went through the process and they said, all the analysts said to them, whatever they said, they said, we want to do it. And to me, it made a huge difference. And it made a huge difference, not only to me, but to my company. Because my, the company that, that uh, the last company that I did was a startup that rose very, very quickly. Uh, uh, people didn't really have the ability to follow up what's going on and didn't have the visibility but they saw what they saw and that increased their trust and respect. So in a way, I can tell you that my management, my, my success was not because I'm a, the best physicist, uh, but because I was able to take a team to do the impossible. And to, to do the impossible is only because each one of my crucial team had a personal commitment to me. Yeah, go ahead. So I wrote something down that came from, from this group, which I think was really important. And I want to share it with you to see if I heard it right, uh, or if you all would help me improve this or, or whatever. But I wrote it down, if trust and respect is breaking down, decide, is the person more important than the culture or company? That's what I wrote down. And I added the culture part. I think you were saying company before, Yoram. But, uh, and this is the question for Michael, isn't it? I mean, the question Michael has to ask is, are these people who are giving their time, if I understood you right, to donating their time to help accomplish something that they feel in their heart enough about to stop doing what they could be doing and do this instead? Now, they, one of the things about that is that they made the choice their choice. And so Michael is wondering, is there something that I can do about, about that? Yet I'm so struggling because the whole organization doesn't accomplish what it, what it might accomplish. So it seems to me that, and this is to Francesca's uh, point too, that, that we were saying earlier, how do you do this? Well, one of the things is you can't pick very many things. You can have, you should have intolerables in your company, but it should be a very short list. I have four. And two of them 
are aspirational. And therefore, how much do I expect someone to aspire to behaving in a certain way? And that's a very difficult one. So I really, I'm down to two that are black and more black and white. That I that these are things that that I've said that I I think this is important to the organization. And if you want to be a part of the organization, I'm asking you to consider embracing these two intolerables. And I'm telling you that if you do not, that I'm like Sun Tzu, I have to pull my my uh, sword out and off goes your head or, you know, I, 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 and I, I don't have to be mad at you or anything. It's simply a choice. It's it's OK if you don't agree with me. I'm not asking. I'm not saying I'm right. I don't know. I'm just saying that this is what as the person who has the authority to make the decision, this is the decision I've made. And then I think what you find, and, and Yoram, I think you would support this, that, that the cohesion comes in. A few people will go out that they don't want to make that transition. But then you've at least been clear with them about what it is that you're, that you're trying to accomplish or the, the approach through which it's okay to accomplish whatever it's you're trying to do. You know, when you are in high tech, your uh, goal is to come to the market as quickly as possible before someone bypasses you with a product that the customers would love to have and, and would want to buy. And that is the issue. Now, you form a group of people and you want them to all work 20 hours a day, not because you pay them, but because they want to, because they feel they are part of the success. That's what it is. Now, why someone, I remember myself as a young engineer, I worked around the clock. I didn't care how, if they pay me at all. I wanted to succeed. It was my goal. If my team will win, it will be my personal win, although my portion in it was like infinitesimal. That is what you want to do when you manage a company, at least in this area. I'm sure that in other areas, it's different. Uh, some, some companies don't work that way. But what I learned in, 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 in my life is that when you apply these rules of building a company to any business, it becomes a smacking success. And the only thing that you have to make sure that the person at the top does not forget the, the rules of every morning, syndag and DDD and finding a solution and tweaking and moving because you can really fall off the cliff very quickly. That is the issue the, 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 and, and, and it is not just personally, it is when you run a company, it is the mutual trust and respect that makes the difference. Not the color of the thing, not how much money they invested in you and not anything. It's the mutual trust and respect. And it needs to be with all the component. And there are employees, vendors, customers, and shareholders. So Henry, if you don't Henry. create mutual trust and respect in all of them, with all of them, you will not succeed. Henry, I want to respond to you. And, and I want to thank uh, Francesca Yoram, uh, and you, Henry, uh, because really almost at the very end, it suddenly daunted on me or kind of <laughs> collapsed, <laughs> although it's not an ideal world, but it kind of came all in, in something which you said, Henry, uh, and I'll be uh, as, as simple and clear as can be. When you suddenly brought it in, Henry, and said maybe mutual trust and respect for you, for me, should be simplified, uh, it helped me. When you said maybe you should identify for the purpose of this diverse team, a more simplified version, a, a, a specific items, so the different people could un, unify or come together around things, it suddenly really landed uh, for me and I saw it. Be, because in that scale, I suddenly saw, Henry, that different people are on that scale in different places. Some mm -hmm. are higher 
on the mutual trust and respect and some are way uh, back. And, and then I understood they are not equal. And if we could agree, or if I could agree with myself, what would unify them? And when you said cohesion, I understood. Uh, that would be a great example of what these two could be. Two, three, that's not the issue in your point, I think. Your point was mentoring me to identify things that in my struggle, I would feel more comfortable and then generate that uh, to that diversity. I think it's a good, very good beginning for me. And, and I could come back to the team and say, where am I in, in that thought process? So thank you. I had three mentors steering me in that tornado. I don't think it's simple. I think it's, it's harder than I thought. Uh, mm -hmm. um, people are not as easy, Francesca, as uh, maybe it's obvious, but it, because there are so many versions of people, you, you cannot come up to one understanding uh, maybe this is a conversation with the therapist, but uh, there's, it's, there's no, I, I need the other Michael for that conversation. There's no way to come up with a formula. That's why I asked you, Yoram, in the beginning, is it one methodology? And I struggle with it, Yoram, because th every person is a methodology. And how do you manage so many variants of how people behave? I need to contribute to people. I need to help them. I see that as the role of a, of a CEO, help them maximize themselves. There's so many talents in so many people. So, Michael, Michael, you. all five of us or four of us are here because we have some kind of trust and respect of to course. the methodology. Otherwise we won't be here, right? No so, because we have so Isaac. I, neither, neither one of us control all the others, but we have a common interest. Mutual trust and respect is a tool to define common interest. And what we achieve in management is common interest. How you achieve common interest? If you increase mutual trust and respect, that's the methodology that's using these tools. It's not something that, um, and that's what I'm trying to say. So uh, uh, the reason why, why I gave the, the uh, example of uh, uh, Francesca is that Francesca uh, sent an email and asked something about love and, and, and trust and respect. And I responded to her and I said, you know, I think based on your question only, I think that I can love you. I hope that I didn't offend her, but I think that I can love you. Well, what does it mean? <laughs> that I can love you. I can love you is not because I have any agenda, but because I want to create trust and respect. I want to continue the dialogue. I want to continue the dialogue because Francesca has the, the potential to be trustworthy and respectful and do it mutually. That is not something that is easy to gain. This is something that you want to do everywhere in your life. And I try to. I did it very successfully in my companies. And I, 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 I fight with Ichak almost weekly on, on how to use the tools to accomplish the goal. I don't know if uh, you received, he, um, he sent a, uh, an email just yesterday. Oh, we need to uh, do something against the system. Did you see this email? It has a little two minutes video why we need to oh, yes. Yes. unite all the, the all the world nonprofits and fight the system. And, and 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 the problem is that we don't talk to each other. He said in, in Santa Barbara there are 900 uh, NGOs and nobody talks to each other. And if they don't talk to each other, they can't really succeed. They have all the money that they need, they have all the people that they need, they have all the wishes that will win, but they can't get anywhere. And it's broad, it's everywhere. Supply chains have fallen apart now because the point of consumption doesn't communicate with its supplier who doesn't communicate with the manufacturer. It's everywhere. No, no, that's true. But the problem, the problem is that if you listen to his uh, video, he started by saying that democracy is failing. Yes, democracy is failing. 
it's a good, it's a, it's time to recognize that democracy is failing. And the question is, can you resurrect democracy? Now, the difference between Ichak and I is that I think that you cannot resurrect democracy. Democracy is dead. It's only a question of time before it will disappear. And I can explain to you why. Part of the reason is if you look at the leading democracy, maybe the United States is a good example. If it's not the leaders, one of the leading democracy, you can see that the level of trust and respect among those who make decisions here is deteriorating. The trust in the US Supreme Court is 23% approval rate. The people, the American citizens, the smart and the less smart, do not believe that the US Supreme Court can do what it's supposed to do. And they don't trust the nine justices by saying, we, not, we want to pack the court. They think that if they put 20, they'll be able to uh, get yeah. better results. No, they'll get worse <laughs> results. Yes. Because if nine cannot get along, 20 for sure will not be able to get along. Maybe so, seven, so, but huh? not, not more. Huh? Maybe seven instead of nine, but yes. Well, you know, uh, it, it, it used to be, uh, historically, it started with six. Yes. And then they made it seven. And then for whatever reason, they made it nine. and But they didn't solve the problem. No. And if you're studying the Constitution, which is one thing that I do, uh, uh, I realized that we're, we're in decline because we're not trying to solve the problem. We're, we're not trying. So uh, you need to go, Michael? Sorry. Okay, no problem. We're we not need trying to be to... winding up. And I think Francesca wanted to get in here too. I saw, saw her unmute herself. No, I was waving to Michael. <laughs> uh, before you unmuted yourself, well, you were muted before and you stopped. Were you going to say something, Francesca? No. No, I want to say to Michael that the diversity is important and not only bringing all people you need to, to to bring people together, but not the essence uh, change, of change, using the diversity to to yeah. to enrich. So, uh, so your just to finish my sentence. Sorry. Just to finish my sentence. If Sorry. you will. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I I wrote back like I write back to each other every week. I wrote back to each other, and I said to him, each other, you're not using your methodology. You're not using your own tools. Let's do Sindag. Why democracy is dying? And if we find out why democracy is dying, maybe we can figure out what will it take to resurrect it. And if you don't make a plan, for sure you will not go anywhere. So, so I, I believe that it could be done, and but uh, and what I'm doing is one little thing in the right direction, uh, and I believe that if I succeed, it will make a change. And the change will be absolute, no, but it will make a change. And and I can tell you how I think, based on the methodology, you can save democracy. This is a big thing. Yeah, that's a worthwhile discussion. Uh, and maybe we can do that another time, but I think we're out of time. So yeah. uh, I thank you all. So Francesca, thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> and thank you. By the way, when you made your first comment, I was just about to call on you because I wanted to hear from you because it seemed, seemed like the three of us were, were speaking more and, and not, not allowing you in. So you were, your timing was really, really good. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right. That's Anyways, uh, it is recording, and I'm sure that Ichak has a chance to uh, listen to it, and hopefully the next one will be able to proceed from here. Yeah, very good. Thank you all for your- Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.